Today we'll be talking about TensorFlow. How many people are familiar with TensorFlow? Name. All right, that's a good number. Yeah, last time I gave this talk, nobody was. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Vikram. I am co-founder for Omni Labs. Omni Labs is a company in San Francisco. We do marketing data analytics, and based on that, we provide suggestions, how should you move your budget and everything else to our marketers. Uh, I'm also a Google Developer Expert on Google Cloud. So if you have any cloud-based questions, go for it. I can hopefully answer all of those. If not, like I'll direct you to somebody who can. All right? I'm not an expert on TensorFlow, so just so, so you know. But I have used it enough that I can talk about it. So hopefully, this will be good. All right, what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is the number one machine learning library on GitHub. In my opinion, it's the number one library there is, like out there. But on GitHub, based upon GitHub stars and uh, how people are collaborating on it, is the number one. Now, what makes it number one? We'll go through that, and why should you use it? All right. So, it's number one library in machine learning. What is machine learning? When you think about making your machine learn something, I guess most of the people here are software developers. You are actually making your machines do something. They know how to do some very specific task that you code it about, right? But the challenge ever happens when you have to code your machine to do a lot of tasks. And you cannot code everything in. Like there are only so many if else conditions you can write before you are like diving yourself in there and you cannot figure out which if condition does what and you have to write test cases, so many of those. So in that case, we come to machine learning where you have to write programs which are basically changing, evolving, and the number of variations that are available in there are too much, or the parameters are too much. Like in if conditions, you have to pass if x is equal to 0 to 1. Those could change based upon what the new input data is, based upon what was the previous data. And when you come to these kind of scenarios, you have to or should write a machine learning program that can do it easier for you. One of the easiest one to understand, uh, one of the algorithms easiest one to understand is sklearn has a Tree structure, I don't, I'm forgetting the name, but it will very easily show you if and else conditions. There's an example of iris out there. So uh, in a very simple example, what does it do? You pass it an image, and it will use all the image components. So it will take pixel by pixel, uh, the whole image, pixel by pixel, that becomes its input layer. Then it has multiple layers. So TensorFlow is a machine learning library. You can use it for normal mathematics, stats, data science, basic. And you can use it for deep neural network. The part where TensorFlow really shines is the deep neural network. So you can have multiple layers of neurons. We will talk about what are what do they do. But in the end, you have an output layer. Output layer basically decides whether this is the cat or the dog, whatever you have trained it upon. So it takes your raw image, goes through a set of neurons, and comes out with the result that you want. All right? This is the same way that humans perceive anything. So deep learning is very, very similar to how human, humans think about something. And we will see this later in course. All right, so why the name TensorFlow? What does it mean? So tensor is multidimensional array. Anything that you're passing to your code, is passing to your program or TensorFlow program, becomes a multidimensional array. Even if it's an image, if it's text, doesn't matter. All of your code ends up becoming a multidimensional array. And your flow is a graph of how the operation should be. The biggest things that makes TensorFlow better than other libraries is its graph flow. You don't normally, you don't write code which executes directly. You write code, you create a graph, and then you execute it. I will see how, why this makes TensorFlow better, all right? Better than other libraries. So very easy to remember, data is your tensor, and flow is your graph, so TensorFlow. All right, now data. So this is an image. How do we make this data? I talked about everything becomes multidimensional arrays. So this is like not two-dimensional array. Right? You can split this whole image into two dimensions. And anywhere where there's white, you say it's 0. Anywhere where there's color, based upon the density of color, you pass it the no values. So really black goes 1, then based upon that, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Right? So that's your multidimensional array. Any image can be translated like that. Uh, it's not exactly equal because it's not an actually, like you cannot reproduce that based upon the array, but it's similar. You can say that, okay, yeah, these are uh, yeah, equal almost. All right, so that was data. Now graph. So you got your data, any data that can be, 
and then the car. So TensorFlow is really unique in this case that rather than writing your code to execute, you write your code to build a graph. You can write that code in Python. There's also C++. There are other frameworks which are coming up, other languages that you can use to write your TensorFlow code. But majorly people prefer Python because Python is the officially supported language and like it's easy to use, every data scientist people use that. So yeah, high level language is Python. Then graph is compiled and optimized. So think of this. Let's say you wanted to go from here to like some other part of the city. I'm not familiar with the city, so I don't know where you will go. But let's say you were going somewhere else. There could be multiple routes to go there. And you can define, rather than defining the exact route, you can define, OK, I want to make sure that I want to go to this place, and then go to this place, and then go to the final destination. So what TensorFlow will do, this is uh, not Google Maps versus code. It, in code, it will identify the best path to go there. What could happen is, let's say in this uh, example that we have, there could be one of the layers which is taking much time, which is not ready for you to pass along. TensorFlow will wait for it and then pass the data along. What this makes is better is you can run TensorFlow on distributed systems. So there could be like hundreds of servers running TensorFlow at the same time and processing one big chunk of data. What would happen is, let's say one of your servers, you are waiting for one variable to come out of one cluster. It will wait for it. You don't have to write all that code. So TensorFlow makes it very easy so that you can write your code as you would, but when it's running, executing in a big cluster, you don't have to write some extra code on top of it to make sure that the data, are, data is coming properly all the time, fine and everything. You just keep writing. And finally, TensorFlow will make sure that all the data comes in properly, goes in as it should, and write. OK? So graph can be executed in parts or fully. So when you will be, when we'll be showing an example today, when I'll be doing that, it will run fully on my machine. Versus what you can do is you can run it in parts. Sometimes people are running this in like conjugation of my machine, cloud server, some uh, small Raspberry Pis, some other uh, machines that I, we have at office, and run all of them together as a cluster. So you can not only use your cloud on your machine, but also like very small devices, small Raspberry Pis. You can use your Android phones as well. So it can run on multiple devices. Now nodes here in this graph, like explaining this graph is as simple as like as you would normally see any graph, like. You take the data, any arrow is directional graph, it is passing the data, any point is a node, some action is happening over there. Data is the tensors that is flowing between them. All right? So nodes are computational points, and data is all the arrows that you see. All right. Now, question happens is, can I use this for normal uh, systems, everyday operations that I use? How, how good is it against things that I normally use? So it's very similar to NumPy. There are reasonable distinctions, because uh, think of data structures, how many people are like familiar with some backend on data structures and everything. The issue is every programming language has their data structures in a way that makes that programming language better. All right? So Python has their data structures. NumPy provides a better way to use those data structures and more data structures. So there are more, and based upon those, they have better operations. Same way, TensorFlow provides you even better data structures. Data structures for which you can get data from distributed systems. Data structures which can hold really large set of data. There are multiple papers which are published uh, by TensorFlow team and Google Brain team, which talk about, uh, sorry, data sets, my bad. Uh, whew, uh, multiple new types of storing, data storage, in like people better than linked lists, better than all the conventional programming that we have used. There are new data sets emerging on new ways to store data. That is very different by machine learning and like in their sense. OK, so normal operation, add, multiply, math multiply, they are, of course, all over there. Plus, it provides you other uh, functions which are based upon deep neural networks and uh, machine learning, more or less. All right, so uh, how does it work? You got uh, your components that you will use to write your code. How does it actually work? So you have a normal Python program. When you execute it, it generates a TensorFlow graph. Very simple. So uh, we will go through this by step by step. All right. All right. So what is machine learning problem? Any problem? How do you define a machine learning problem? So we talked about a very exam uh, starting example, which was if-else conditions. You have to write a lot of if-else conditions, and it could change. So a simple program here is y is equal to mx plus b. You have to find this. What you are, what we are doing here 
is these are two parameters, M and B. These could be your if conditions. Now you have to find for all the possible values that could be plotted on a graph, the best values for MX, uh, M and B that the line is at the least distance. Okay? What you're trying to do is some random points on a graph, you're trying to plot a line that is from the least distance from all of those. Okay? So what you can do is, let's say if this was my graph, I could draw a line right here. But that would be really far from all the points that are at the top. Or I could draw a line here. And but that would be really far from these points. So what you're trying to do, you're trying to optimize a line that is uh, like median distance, least distance from all of the points. To do that, now, there are multiple ways you can do that. Of course, you can go into the graph and find out each value and then like do it by hand, write if conditions for all the points and the points that might arrive. But I wouldn't suggest that, really bad idea. What you can do is you can train a machine learning model to do that. Okay, so we'll use this formula to train a line to come up onto a point. All right, so writing the TensorFlow program, really easy. All we are doing, the R code that we saw, is just right here. Everything else is just to make sure that program runs. So the same way you will define your variables, we define some variables. So there's a different type of variable placeholder versus actual variables. So the things that we are trying to find, we are trying to find M and B. Those will become normal variables versus anything that was provided to us. In this formula, X is provided to us. We have to find Y using M and B, okay? So M and B are variables. X is provided to us, so that's a TensorFlow place placeholder. And yeah, you can define what type it is. So it's a float value. Mostly computation in floats is really easy. So it's always go for that. And this is just to prepare that execution. Remember we talked about it always creates a graph. So up till at this point, it has only created a graph. It has not run it. TensorFlow only created a graph up till this point. So when you said X, we will show this, hopefully. I don't remember if I have that in slides. But up till this point, there's only graph. What you need to do is create a session to run that graph. Now this session that we create at this point can be on your own machine, or this session can be distributed across different, different machines, different types of machines, and even clusters of different machines. All right. After that, we initialize the variables. And like very simple, and then this we run it. So this session.run is running, taking a session and running the code, the graph that we created, right here. So wait, yep, all right. So it ran that graph. Now what happens is, how does this machine learn automatically? What is learning for it? So learning for it is other way around. Uh, like thought process becomes other way around. You have to think about learning rather than, rather than thinking about learning, you have to think about error. Okay, so let's say our code came up to this point, somewhere over here, and he said this is the perfect point for the error. Okay, like this is the point where you should draw the line. But what we know is that is not the point, point is somewhere down here. So we have to minimize the loss. Remember that graph, this, let's say it plotted this first line, okay? And then it said that, okay, what is my error? What is my loss? So your loss is right now, this huge distance that you are missing, okay? So you have a big loss. What you do is, you try to minimize your loss. So rather than optimizing for anything else, you say, I have a big error, let's minimize this error. When the my error is minimum, that's my result, as low as I can get on my error. So your, your graph, your plus line was here, you had a big loss, because it shouldn't be like that. That is not the correct answer. That is not the least distance. So you, what you do is you provide your code with a way to minimize loss. So two important things. First, you need to know what your formula is. Second, you need to know what your loss is. What is the thing that you're trying to optimize for? And then third, you need a way to optimize that loss. Optimize that loss basically means reduce that loss. Okay? So we go forward right here. So gradient descent is a formula to reduce your loss. So what it does, it, it plots the whole loss. So this is the loss, the loss uh, dimension or array. What you're trying to do is you're trying to go to the least loss. Now you can go that in big jumps. You can say, my code was right here. Let's take a 30 step kind of jump and we'll be right here. Okay? But what that means is that will be the first iteration. In the next iteration, what could happen is, like this is uh, <laughs> this kind of surface, so you were here, came down here and you jumped past your minimum loss. 
So there are steps. How big of a step can you take to minimize your loss? Think about this as a uh, I know shooting range, people go to that or like the dart throwing. So you are throwing a dart and you have to go to the center of that. But let's say you were a little bit off. So you can, if you had like the perfect system, you can say, okay, let's next time let's try 0.5 centimeters, or you can say next time let's try one meter. Based upon that, you can like come closer and closer and closer. All right? So what gradient descent does is it tries to understand what is the surface and it tries to use the gradient to slowly come down. Gradient basically says slope. What is the slope? So minimum surface is at the very bottom and then there is a surface around it. What you have to do is you have to go to the very bottom. Then you can go there in small steps. You can go there in bigger steps based upon how you choose. What is suggested is don't take your steps so small that it takes like 3,000 iterations to go there and don't take your steps so large that you are like jumping across that point but never actually reaching that point, right? So two things, uh, three things to remember, your own formula, loss, and how you optimize it. Optimization can be done in steps. Make sure that your step, choosing that step right now is a manual thing. You have to manually try multiple times, but there are, there's work being done around that as well so that you can identify that even by program. So like program can understand how much step should might be, should step be. All right. So putting it together, the code that we saw earlier, other than that, we have added only three lines. All right? First line is basically defining the loss. So we said our loss is the mean distance between the points and my the final row, the uh, final line that I have plotted. Okay? So I found a mean distance between all the points. So I have to reduce the mean. Okay? My optimizer is gradient descent, and this is my step. I'm saying take small step, 0.5. That is the max step that you can take. Okay? So I define my loss, I define my optimizer, and then I just train it. I train my optimizer to minimize my loss. Simple as that, right? So you had a formula, you took loss, you took an optimizer, and you train it to minimize your loss. Getting it, everybody? Yes, no? I don't see much energy here. All right, so define a loss, create an optimizer, minimize your loss. And after that, it's just running. So again, we just got in here. What we are doing is, a machine learning program cannot learn in one single step. I don't remember like I don't remember how I started learning saying words, but I'm sure if you have some kids in your family and like distance family, you can see that they start with very small words and slowly and slowly and slowly, after multiple iterations, they come to something that they want to learn. This is true in case of even right now, like if you wanted to learn a new programming language, something new, you will start with very small step, you will iterate on it multiple times until you learn something better, bigger. And as many iterations as you do, you will become better. So what we are doing here is we are iterating it 1,000 times. So we run our code 1,000 times to make sure that our machine learns. Sure. Um, and, I'm sorry. I understand the code, so I don't understand when you talk about one through iterations and when you describe looking at any How are you estimating how many iterations you have to go through to find the most optimal path? Even that is right now a very manual task. You have to identify, like, how many steps should I go? What is the minimum step that I should take? But we are like, not me, but somebody is working on that to make sure that these, even these steps can be identified by machine. Yeah. So it's possible that if you take a thousand steps, you maybe didn't find the absolute best solution is what you're saying, right? That's true, yeah. We will see that in an example. Question? How is that more than question? Ah, he asked the question like, how do you know how many iterations should you go? So we will come to that point, like how do you know that you are at a good iteration point? We'll see that a bit. All right, so is this clear right now? Take base formula that you have to actually use to compute your stuff, find a loss, find an optimizer, minimize your loss using that optimizer, good? All of this code, presentation, everything will be available online, so don't worry about that. All right, demo, nice, good point. Just start a demo. Again, this is not a big demo, you all can go and see this. And we will see. Oh, right here. All right. So what uh, Google team did, TensorFlow team did, is they created a neural network right here in the browser. And you can run this. You cannot break this. They promised this, at least. So hopefully your system doesn't break. And what we are going to do is we're going to try a classification problem. So machine learning can be classified into different, different things. If you haven't like done a basic course, I would suggest Andrew Ng. He does a really good machine learning basics course. Look for that, or Udacity right now has best courses available. But basically what we are trying to do in this program is, this is our 
uh, graph, rather than having a straight line graph, we have a very complex graph here. Rather than trying to point out points that could fit in one line, we have to go into spirals. And spirals even are two colors. There's not only one single thing that you're trying to optimize. You're trying to optimize two things now. Right? And you have to plot your graph so that you can plot on those. <coughs> so what we are doing here is we start with very simple formula, x1, x2, and sine of x. And then we go two-layer deep neural network. We have eight neurons in one, six neurons in one, another, and we have three in the final third layer. What does this mean? Like when people talk about multiple layers, what does it basically mean? So let's say your image, the way, the way humans learn, or as much as research has suggested that humans learn, is they perceive small objects. They perceive the color. Then they perceive the edges. And then they perceive the whole object. And like it could be multiple iterations, but I'm saying like this one, three neural networks that I've made, three layer. What you do is each layer learns something different than other layer. So as we will run it, you will see that one layer learns something, then second layer learns on top of it, and third layer learns on top of it. So what you're doing is you're transferring the learning that was done by first layer to another one, to another one. And this way, you don't have to be, you don't have to create a lot of things in one single layer. Think of this like you can have 256 colors, uh, like there are millions, but let's on the base, you can have, have 256 colors. So first layer could be 256. Or in the previous example that we did, we did monochrome. If your first layer can be two colors only, it will work fine. Then you go next layer where it is trying to find edges. So based upon that, you can like, even, even this is something that you have to play with right now. How many layers should I have? How many neurons should I have? But an easy way to figure out is like, your base layer should be based upon how many variables you have, 256 colors, two colors, thousands of languages, one pathway, based upon how you are doing that. And your final layer output should be based upon what is the end result that you are trying to get to. We'll come to that, those in a minute, like the final example. But let's run to this. So important things to note, epoch is number of iterations. This epoch here, can you see my mouse? Oh, yeah. So epoch is number of iterations we'll go through. This is the neural network whole. And this is the problem that we are trying to optimize. OK? Take a look on this graph. This graph will be important. We'll be plotting a graph here, and then we'll go through this. All right? All right. So we started running our neural network. This is running 50 iterations, 60 iterations. Right now, it's trying to optimize. Not really doing anything. Seems like it's stuck. There's nothing happening. See the graph? It was really flat. It got totally stuck. It didn't know what to do, where to go. And then suddenly, it found out, oh, there are colors. This is what I have to do. I have to find out a possible path. So immediately started to learn a lot of things. Minimize the loss. This was your loss. So it minimized your loss very quickly. And then it's now trying to find out the perfect optimal way to differentiate between blue and yellow. It does it really well around 1,000 steps. So we'll see. My learning rate, 0 0.03. 0 0.5 in the previous example that we were doing online. Right here, 0 0.02. <coughs> I don't have any regularization. Uh, training to test data is 50%. So let's see. On 1,000 steps, it should perfectly identify yellow versus blue. All right, all right. Getting there. Oh, it's already there. All right, so we went through 1,000 some iterations. One iteration will never give you results, at least as per whatever I have done. One iteration will never give you results. You have to go to multiple iterations. Best way to do 500, 1,000, and based upon that, how are you going to go through? But see what we did here. We learned, we started with two very simple objects. We said one straight line. One perpendicular line and one horizontal line. Those are my basic inputs on which we'll start. And one uh, sigmoid function here, or sine function here, is one which we'll start. Now each layer here has something very different that they are learning. This layer is learning slightly tilted horizontal layer, horizontal line. This here is some zigzag line. Another one is like really zigzag. But when you combine this with this, and it comes to the next layer, it becomes even better. Here they are, it's recognizing four quadrants. And like somewhere here, it's trying to even go into like circular spaces. I, I understand this is not very really visible, but you can run this code on your own. But what it is trying to do is, from one layer to another, it's passing what it has learned in first layer to another one, and that layer is improving upon what was learned previously. And finally, it comes to this result, which is actual optimization, what it should have done. All right, we clear on this? Questions? Go ahead. So you have the, the x and the y, and they look, they look at an image with a spiral, and they're trying to, em to find the rules to emulate it, to do it again? Yeah, so actually, any, nothing is looking at any spiral. 
It doesn't know what is a spiral. Okay. All it knows is this pixel has a value 1, this pixel has a value 0, or in this case 256 okay. or 259 or 30, whatever that is. Yeah, it okay. just knows those values. What it is trying to do is it is trying to optimize towards that if there is blue, the surrounding area should be blue. That's what it has to color, and that's what it is trying to optimize. It doesn't know spirals. It doesn't know spirals exist even. Okay. It started with two lines. It just knows horizontal and parallel lines, or horizontal and vertical lines. My bad. So it's trying to guess, and then it tells us if it's sort of right or wrong? Yeah, so it, it was trying to guess, OK, what is the perfect way to color this? OK? The loss was however far you are, however far the color is. That was the loss. We tried to optimize that loss. Okay. So we optimized the loss, and we said that, OK, if yellow point is here, your yellow uh, circle or like yellow color shouldn't be really far off and go into blue. So what it is trying to do is just minimize that loss and keep the distance between blue to the blue color really low. Go ahead. Um, so can this network now be used with a new image? Yeah. So, but we, we'll come to that as well. Or do you have <laughs> we have an example, final example, we'll, in which we'll cover almost all of these things. So this network can be used to do other stuff, other images, other types of things. That is the beauty of machine learning or uh, deep learning, that you train a network on one thing, and then you can use it now across other things, which are similar. You can't really do like image-based algorithm into text classification. That won't work because all it knows is about images. It knows edges and everything. It doesn't know semantics about grammar and everything. So you can't really use that kind of thing. But if there is an image model, you can use it to classify other types of images as well. So this is a line. Uh, this is plotting a line. And you can use that to do other stuff as well. So OK, 1,000 iterations, loss. Remember, this is the loss where it was starting to find, and there was it could not optimize that loss because loss was becoming constant. It was trying out multiple things, couldn't find out a way to minimize the loss. Here, it found a really good way to optimize that loss, and here you see a lot of like ziggling up is happening. Why is that? We talked about step. How much step can you take? And we talked about you could jump around, but still not find find your actual optimized path. That's what happening is here. So based upon this graph, you can understand. Okay. Seems like there's a lot of jiggle happening in my code. What I should do is make my training step a little bit smaller so that it doesn't variate a lot, so that I can reach my point faster rather than just a lot of iterations. But what you could also find is this big chunk, like almost 500 iterations went through, and it didn't do anything. Maybe what I should do is I should take a longer leap. So these are things that you will have to come through and point and like understand, uh, yeah, doesn't matter. Because if I take a bigger one here, I'm going to lose on the final point. If I take a smaller one, it's going to take 3,000 iterations to come to that point. So you are trying to optimize between both of those. And this is right now a very manual problem. You have to figure it out, multiple test cases, and running it. But hopefully, machines will solve it. All right, back to presentation. I had a question. Oh, go ahead. How did you pick the number of neurons for each layer? So this takes some time. Uh, this is like, a, if you go to the base website, let's just go there. It's not really there. Like this is a very simple example where they start with. So I had to actually go through and like try this multiple times. I had to add some layers here. You can add as many layers. You can add as many you want. But you can find an optimal layer again. Like some things are still manual, but machine is taking care of most of those. And hopefully later in time you will see machine taking care of almost all of these things. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, Google is working upon AutoML. AutoML is basically saying take a lot of machine learning models pass them through uh, another machine learning model, which identifies which machine learning model is good. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully, someday, uh, even our jobs will be gone. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, somebody else had a question. Question? No? Good. All right. Next step. I'm not hopeful about that, OK? <laughs> I don't want my job to be gone. All right. So we, talk, we saw TensorFlow, how it is works. Now, what makes it special? Why is it, I, I'm sure that other libraries also do this kind of stuff. Like this is the basic machine learning theory. There's no reason for machine uh, for TensorFlow to be really hyped about this versus other machine learning languages. There's PyTorch, there's some things from Facebook, there are other companies which are doing this. Why is TensorFlow so much in news and such a hype? So let's go to that. Hopefully it's not a hype. That is like missing some components, so we'll come here. OK, so at the very ground level, as it is with all the programming components that we work upon every day, is the actual hardware, where it is going to run. Right? So this hardware has their own components, own libraries, own execution functions. Intel writes something, and we see that what is happening with that. And everybody has their own set of instructions. 
Okay, these are based on CPU that are there. This has got the GPU in there. This could be TPUs, TensorFlow processing units, which are really new, designed specifically for TensorFlow, like hardware even optimized. Okay, then what you have is a distributed execution engine. This is something that I'm like so amazed by, because initially when you had previously machine learning algorithms, you had to write this layer, and you had everybody had to write this layer, and nobody could get it perfect. Because what happens is you can, let's say Facebook had, I want to run it only on my server, versus a uh, university has their own machines that they are running in their house, in their campus, and they want to use those. It used to take a lot of time to set up all those machines to be ready to run this, and this just solves it, everything. You just connect everything to a proper cluster. It could be your Android device, iOS device, machine, small machines, GPU, whatever you can have, and just connect it to the distribution engine, execution engine, and it will run without you having to worry about it. So this is like core. You don't have to worry about these things, but these are there, so you know. Then you have, you have to actually write your code. This is where execution happens, but then you have to actually write your code. How do you write your code? You can write in Python. You can write it in C++. There are people who are trying to do it in JavaScript even. And you can write everything. I, I am a fan of Node.js, so I say go Node.js, JS everywhere. But you can write the way TensorFlow is written. You can write any front end to it. This front end is basically how you write your code. And right now, officially supported is Python, but you can write anything, like any language you can use to write that. Now, you write your code. What are you actually writing? What are you actually doing in that? You are creating layers. We saw that initially in that example, the playground example, that we created a few layers which each contain neurons. So what you're doing is you are creating layers. To create a layer, again, used to be a really manual task when you were talking about deep learning in like 1980s. Deep learning is not a new concept. It has been around for years. But to do that, to do write all those code, to run it distributed in a distributed system, to have the data optimized properly, it was a really manual challenge. And that's why, like, uh, at least in theory, that's why machine learning didn't took off at that point. It didn't have so much compute. It, no, nobody had so much time to write all of these layers properly. And you had to write all of those manually. Didn't work. TensorFlow gives you a really easy way to write those layers. And when you write layers, you end up creating a model. So right here, you can use your own layers to write your own models. But let's say I'm not really uh, an expert in writing layers and understanding how much should my step be, how much should my, how many layers of neurons should be there, how many layers should be there. What you can do is you can use already existing models. Those models are provided to you in a way that you can use to train it, like raw code, to train your model based upon your data and you can get a result out, all right? So you can go out, and the same way, if you're familiar with SciPy, SciPy provides you models. It can You can use to train on your own data and get result. TensorFlow also does it. So you can write those in TensorFlow's Estimator API or Keras. Keras is a machine learning framework which allows you to write programs in Keras framework, and it can run on Theano, TensorFlow, and others. Question? OK. All right. So it provides you code for the model that you can run your or train your own data upon, and then you can get your results however you want it. So those are here at this level. But let's say I want to do uh, image optimization, but who can go to Google and try to find out like millions of images and then catalog them properly, create a test data set, and then finally create an algorithm. Like algorithm is right here, but use that algorithm to create a model, then serve it, and all of those things. Then Cephalo provides a way to use canned estimators. Google in themselves, have you heard of Google's uh, Vision API? So they used all those images available to them. They trained a model upon that. And now they have, a can, they have an estimator, which they have put up behind an API. And that API you can use using Vision API. So you don't even have to train a machine learning model. Everything is already done. Model in a box. You pass your data. It gives you a result. So TensorFlow provides from the very ground up of using different types of hardware to the very highest level of using everything as an API. All right? We'll go through these steps in next. All right, so we talked about estimators at this level. And uh, anybody who's familiar with other machine learning libraries knows like what is an estimator looks like. So basically what you're doing is you have a, this is your algorithm right here. What you're trying to do is you have your inputs and your labels. You have your cat images of cats and a label that says cats, images of dogs, label says dogs. What you're doing is you're passing all of that data to your model function. You can pass that data in multiple ways. You can pass the data to fit. So let's say I had millions of images. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that into 90%, 10%, 90% of those I'm going to fit. So I'm going to fitting is basically training. So you are trying to fit these images into a line. Think of that is like very easy. You are trying to fit these images into a model. So what you're doing is with the first function fit, you are training your model. Then you have evaluate. So the way machine learning, the way all of us have learned in like our education is you learn something, then you give an exam or a quiz or something on that. So the evaluate function right here is the quiz that you take. So you take your program, ask it to learn something, and then you quiz it. How good is it doing? Okay. When you are okay, when you are fine with 90% uh, of the times it's giving me proper result, or maybe 99%, in case of like, let's say, image detection right here, you can say, 90% ah, is fine with me. But Tesla can't do that in the road because they're running on the road. And they, they have to go 99.9%. .9%. And even then, like, authorities might not allow them. So yeah, you have to evaluate your code. Then once you are OK, I'm done. My model is ready. It has evaluated. I'm fine with this evaluation. Then you go and actually predict some stuff. You pass it an image, and you predict. What is it done? How is it going? Is it actually identifying my values? The prediction data will be other, other than this 1 million data that we use, so that it doesn't use, it doesn't know already. Like if I show you 100 of times my own image, and then I ask you to know my name, hopefully you have memorized it, you can just actually give that name. But if I ask some other image, you might not know that name properly. So prediction happens on a totally different set of data. All right? And finally, the best part, all of that you have done, and now you can export it. Exporting is so easy that you have to just pass a function, and your whole model is now exported. You can run it on Google, AWS, doesn't matter where, your own machine, your Android phones, your iOS phones, anywhere. Exporting, you can run this training session anywhere in the clusters. And finally, the exported model can go again anywhere, because TensorFlow supports all of the different lower layer devices. All right? Then support. So that was the execution. That was the part where DevOps people get really happy. This is the part where data scientists people get really happy. So TensorBoard, this is the visualization. Uh, now I'm forgetting that. These are called embeddings. So when machine learns, machine automatically, based upon the patterns that it can find, it can detect what, which is what. So this is a handwriting recognition program. And what they did is they passed it a lot of handwriting without telling what is what. What it did, machine automatically learned that all the fives is one cluster. All the threes is another cluster. It has automatically distributed that data into an embedding. Now to visualize this before TensorFlow was there would have taken a lot of things. You have to get all of the data into, again, those two-dimensional arrays. And then you somehow have to think about, huh, how do I plot these two-dimensional arrays so that I can see and understand how they are grouped together? You'd be looking at a lot of numbers. And that's why it used to be so hard. Now it's really easy. All of that is pointed right here. You can zoom in. You can go in. You can go out. You can select special stuff. This is a really complex example, but you can like do anything in here. The graphs that we were looking at earlier, the error rate and loss, you can see all of those here. Based upon your results, you can try a lot of things. So TensorBoard is a plugin that comes with TensorFlow. So TensorFlow runs the execution and all the other stuff. But TensorBoard, you can use to visualize that as well. So you can see how you are doing. How is your program running around? Nice, we are good at time. All right. then. Again, DevOps people, because DevOps people, uh, <laughs> yeah, DevOps people love to do this stuff. You can run it on Google servers, AWS servers, or you can run Raspberry Pi. So somebody created this, a cluster of Raspberry Pis, and they run Kubernetes on that, as well as TensorFlow on that. And like, you can plug out one of those, plug one of those Raspberry out, switch off the power, your machine learning model will still be fine. It will keep running. Like, you don't lose data. All of that is being handled by TensorFlow for you. Your clusters can go down, your clusters can go up. And clusters can be running on this, clusters can be running on uh, Google Cloud, but they will all run fine. Biggest thing to note here is make sure that your network is fine, because what could happen is uh, one of your variables requires 3 GBs of data, and your network here is 1 megabits per second. Even though your model is not doing anything, you are waiting for three days to actually like get the data over there to do something. So network is really important, and that is the reason that I suggest everybody to run your TensorFlow modeling, at least training on Google Cloud. They have the best network out there. All right, finally, we ran all the, all the things we did. Now actually serving it. So serving, as if anybody here is a web developer, they know that you need versions. You need to make sure that you deprecate versions properly. 
like versions don't conflict with each other, the newer versions should have a lower latency than the previous version. All of those things used to be really messy for how organization used to be working. What happened is like there would be a data science team, they will take six months to come up with a model, and then you will pass that model to the engineering team, which will build an API front end to it, and then the engineering team will come back, ah, this is not good. The, this version of model is not good. Let's go back and then write a new version of that, and then again retry that. So the biggest challenge, in I think, as in software development, is how quickly can you iterate? Uh, of course, TensorFlow will iterate for, for you if you have written the code, but how quickly can you iterate on the code that you are writing? And that process has been very, like, I won't say 100% solved, but very, in a good way, solved. So what you do is you take your data, you learn on that, you create a model. Then you can pass that model to TensorFlow Serving. TensorFlow Serving will start running that model, model version one. Next day, you again train your model number two. What you can do is pass that model two into a slash beta, or whatever, however your versioning happens, and you can test between those two models, and you can define, okay, this model is really bad. Let's not use this new version two model. Let's keep using the version one model. And all of that is just like switch off UI. You don't have to actually go and write any code of that, code for that. And you can keep iterating, keep new models keep coming. You can have a function which is like basically testing these models, and based upon that, just switching it, right? So all of that can be easily automated. And request response, this is right now, it provides HTTP APIs and gRPC APIs. I don't know what else would be supported there, but there's a good demand around GraphQL, so hopefully. All right, now, good, okay, it has all these capabilities, who is actually using it? So I can tell that I, we use it at Omni. Google uses it a lot. So they started using it around 2012, but they had an internal program here. So Google has an internal program where they take people from different different sections, Android team and let's say Gmail team and other teams. They come together for a six months kind of class with their brain team and then they learn stuff. It's not that they are actually building some projects there, they're just learning. And after that they go back to their teams and there they implement it, whatever they have learned. And based upon that, like this program was launched here and after that, they have seen a rapid growth. Almost all the products that you use from Google right now, they all have machine learning components inbuilt into it. There's some machine learning code in all of your Google apps that you're using. Gmail has that, Inbox has that. Have you seen Inbox? I Half the time, I'm not even replying. I'm just like taking the example reply that they give in there. I just press on that, it works. It even uses emoji for me. <laughs> yeah. All right, final example. So for this, the code is on GitHub. Uh, I'll provide all of this, hopefully Dan will like give you all of this after the event. But if not, you can just go to GitHub. So here's the code. Hopefully everyone can see it. Okay, so basic directory structure. What, uh, okay, first what we are gonna do with the code. So this code is basically, Google put out a model that is called Inception. Inception is Google's machine learning model for image recognition, okay? So they phase out these models from their own deployments and then push them out for public to use. This is an older version model, like this is 2016, I guess, Inception that they released. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take Inception and train it again upon something else. So this is like another biggest thing of TensorFlow. You can, not exactly of TensorFlow, but deep learning, is you can have a proper model pre-built for you. You can remove the final layer of that model and retrain it, retrain this, that final layer. Google must have taken like a week or more than that, hopefully, to train this model. But we are gonna train this model again on our own images and we'll do it faster because we don't have to train this, all these layers, all the extra layers that they have built. We'll train the final layer. And that way like you can use any model that is available to you, hopefully by legal ways and not just taking other people's models. And you can retrain it to fit your needs your own data. Uh, I recently, not recently, it's been over a year now, moved to Vancouver, and when in Vancouver, it's like really big community of Asians, and I really started liking uh, ramen. And before that, I was really, really fan of pasta. So this example is basically trying to find out uh, images and classify those between whether it's a ramen, whether it's a carbonara, or whether it's a pancit, all right? So three types of images. So what do we have here? In categories folder, we have Images for those, carbonara, pancit, and ramen. These are three folders, which are, the name is what the image are, images are in there, all right? So ramen, will have all the images of ramen. You can go and check it out later, don't worry. We'll do all of this. 
uh, Pancit has all the images of Pancit and Carbonara. There are 100 images of those, only 100 in each of those folders. Okay, and we'll train upon only those 100 images. So this is where the beauty comes in. The original model was trained on millions of images, but I can retrain that model on a very small subset of my images, and I can still use it. It will still work, hopefully, we'll see. All right, go back. Inception. Inception is where my actual model lives right now. So, do they show the size? They don't show the, show the size, but this right here, this zzip file is a big file because that's the model. That's where your actual values are. Okay, the values of uh, M and B, remember? All of those are inside this function, inside this uh, zip file. Go back. Then we have test. Remember, 1 million images, we divided it into 90 and, uh, one, 90 and 10. And then we said, like, we'll use other images to test that, which the model has never seen. So in this test folder, we have few images on which we'll go through. Uh, the images here are, we will see, example. <laughs> You'll see how it does. All right. After that, we have some very basic. This is the training function. This is the file that will actually train. And this is the file label image. This is the one that will actually like label the image after training. Prediction happens over there. All right? OK. So good. Just to make sure people know this, this is exactly the same structure over here. We have bottlenecks. We have, uh, we'll come to that. We have categories. We have inception. And we have test. OK? I will, I'll explain the other directory. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to go to the code. Everybody can run this. If you have TensorFlow installed, things you have to do is install TensorFlow. That's it. And put your images and a new category that you want to train inside categories folder. Create one directory named Vikram. Put all of my photos in there and we'll try to identify me even. OK? So all right, I'm going to just take this code, snippet, and I'm going to run it. So now what it is doing? Everybody can see it. See this code, part of code. Yeah, visible. OK. So I'm passing, my file is retrain.py. Retrain, because I had a model. I'm going to retrain that model. OK? What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bottlenecks. So bottlenecks is basically saying, OK, you can have a big image. And you can train that whole image at once. Like you can have a 1 MB image, and you can train it as 1 MB file. But what would happen is your process will be slow, because it has to load that 1 MB of file into RAM and into CPU do some computation on it, and then again pass that back. The bigger your data is, the slower it becomes through the buses. And like you know, hopefully, that there are L3 caches involved, there are buses involved, there's so much data that can go over wire, even inside CPU. So you want to try to make sure that that data is small. So what you do is, you take your image, you split it into smaller sizes. What you make sure is, it knows which sizes correspond to which image, and like smaller chunks of those images, and you put them in bottlenecks. Okay. Then we have steps. How many steps should we take? We are doing 500 over here. You can do 1,000. You can do 100,000. Doesn't matter. Based upon your how many images you have, we will go for simplicity here, 500 images. Original model that we are using is in inception directory. Output graph. We will see this if using TensorBoard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to train that whole thing. And I'm going to write all the output to a folder on which we will run TensorBoard and see how our model actually like started training, started learning. You can visualize that even. Output label is basically those three files. And image directory is categories. OK, so images are in categories directory. All right, start training. It is running. <laughs> so it will start showing right now. Uh, so of course, there's some warnings, because they just released 1.4, and I'm still on 1.3, and they will just show this. Uh, it's also giving you that you can use CPU. You are using CPU right now, but you can even exceed that limit, like overclocking your CPU, and you can do better. OK, so it started looking for images. It found Pancit, Carbonara, and Ramen, and it created bottlenecks. Bottlenecks split up those bigger files into smaller files. And now it started training. There are loops. Remember, this three chunk is a loop. So right now, accuracy was 97% already. Come on, this is really good, huh? 97% accuracy. We'll run it for 100 of those. So remember, this is training accuracy, 98%. On the training data, the 90%. This is validation accuracy, the extra 10% of data that is there. So validation accuracy is right now 100%. This is really good model, huh? But remember, the cross entropy is defining how good my model is doing. That is the point which we will be looking at. We are trying to minimize that cross entropy. You can keep looking at like training accuracy, really good. You can keep looking at validation accuracy. It could be really good. But if your cross entropy isn't good, 
doesn't matter. Again, these are concepts which are more uh, statistics, statistics and like mathematical than they are about machine learning. All right, final test accuracy 97%. All right, so how many people think can this optimize and like find out? Let's hope it does. All right, so we're gonna start with, first audience has to find out what this image is. What is this? Carbonara. Carbonara, nice, nice. That's good, all right. So we're gonna go back to our script. Uh, what's the file name? File name is 3C. Oh, test slash. All right, so I'm gonna ask my program to label an image, and this is the path that I passed it, okay? Test images were never trained upon. You can see it over here, hopefully better. Test images were never trained upon, and that is the file name, okay? It will try to identify what is Carbonara. Uh, what, what is this file, sorry, my bad. All right, taking some time, slow system, gave me a warning, because I'm on 1.3. Don't worry about warnings. Come on, come on. All right, so remember this. This is slow. You don't want this on your machines. You shouldn't be running this, anything of this on your machines. You should be running this on Google servers or some other servers. And it came out with Carbonara, score is 96.96. One would be 100%, and hopefully your machines don't get one. Pray for that. If you get one, means that your training data is bad or you have something bad in your program, never get one. Get as close as possible to one. Right? So Carbonara, 0.96. How do I now know exactly which one it is? What you do at this point is you try to identify which one is the highest, and <clears throat> you cancel out others. So here we see Pancit, it says 0 0.02. Hopefully this is not a Pancit. Same with Raman. And Carbonara has the highest score. So you return back that this is Carbonara. And this logic, you can write it right now based upon however good you feel about your model, and based upon that you can reason, reason, return results as to what it is. But as a machine learning developer, you just end up resulting like this is the score. All right? Next image. What is this? Thank you. All right, image name is 004. It will again give me a warning. Don't worry about those. <laughs> and come on, come on. Nice, 99% sure that this is ramen. So I had like really high quality images of ramen because <laughs> I wanted you to make sure that you know ramen at least, doesn't matter anything else. So it gave a really high from high predictability that ramen is 99% over there, All right? Huh, so let's try some other image. What is this? Pasta, but which pasta? All right, uh, the image is IMG635. Oh, Come on. You don't want all of this running on your machine. You'll be really slow. People will hate your model. You want this running somewhere else. Carbonara identified 99% because there's not a lot, not a lot of noise in that image. It was really plain image of Carbonara. Right? <clears throat> Finally, a really messy image. What is this? <laughs> this is me eating shit, but <laughs> this is this is what it is. I'm gonna ask it to determine what this is. Uh, this is IMG59. All right. <clears throat> so remember, we trained our model only to identify three types of images: Carbonara, Pancit, and Ramen. And hopefully, you can identify. Oh wow, we are already over time. It came up with Pancit 74, but we know it's not Pancit. So remember, whatever you train your model upon. That is the only thing that is going to identify. It cannot identify something out of the loop. Okay. All right. Finally, let's go back. All of this code is available online. You can just go through that. Let's finish the program. Whew. And demo was done. Finally, next steps: go to Udacity, go to TensorFlow, learn from there. Uh, there's uh, Stanford's course is there. Really good one. Udacity machine learning minor degree is really good. Uh, if you're totally new to machine learning. There are some recipes which are published by Google Developers Group. That is really good. I also mentioned Machine Learning Without a PhD by Martin Garner. That's a really good course. Go through those. Hopefully, you'll find something, learn something, images done. Nice. And that's it. Thank you for coming.